The Tom Woods Show, episode 717. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. If you're a homeschooling parent and you're tired of running yourself ragged, then check out the self-taught Ron Paul curriculum. And check it out through my special link where you get three free bonuses totaling $160. My special link, ronpaulhomeschool.com. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here. I'm telling you, this episode is going to help you win debates. It's going to help you when you're cornered and the inevitable question comes up, what about Sweden? What about Denmark? And so on and so forth. Well, today we're joined by Nima Sanandaji, who is author of the brand new book released just this week, Debunking Utopia, Exposing the Myth of Nordic Socialism. You can find it linked on our show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 717. Nima, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we get started on the details of your argument, tell us something about your own background, because I think that is relevant to your story. Yeah, so my background, I'm a Kurdish-Iranian, and uh, I came with my family to Sweden as a child. And um, like many immigrants, when we came to Sweden, we were uh, trapped in um, welfare dependency. So although my uh, father and mother had successful jobs in Iran, they became dependent on the welfare state in Sweden. And so we we grew up in a, you know, marginalized uh, welfare state family, welfare supported family. Uh, Later, I got a PhD and I've um, been working on uh, public policy issues. I've written more than 100 uh, public policy reports and uh, around 20 books, mostly about the um, situation in Sweden, Nordics, and other parts of Northern Europe. So that's my background. And I'm the president of the uh, European Center for Entrepreneurship and uh, Policy Reform. All right. Okay. Very good. Very good. So you have, a, you have an interesting and unique both outsider and insider kind of perspective on Sweden, and you bring that to bear in your uh, in your study here. Now, you begin with what I've talked about on the show quite a bit, which is the, I don't know, maybe the comic book version of the of the Nordic economic system that we have in the United States, whereby they have high taxes. It is a uh, it's portrayed to an American audience anyway, as a socialist system, extremely heavy uh, public sector, and it's had nothing but good results for everybody. So if you want income equality, social mobility, economic prosperity, and all kinds of uh, public sector benefits, then you should adopt this model. That's that's the mainstream view from, oh, certainly the mainstream left view, which means it's the view that's imposed on everybody around here. At what point as you were getting older and, and, and getting to understand your surroundings better, did you realize that there's something wrong with that way of thinking about Sweden in particular? You know what? I mean, the reason I wrote a Debunking Utopia Exposing the Myth of Nordic Socialism is that the Nordic countries are often used as a main argument by the left for why socialism, democratic socialism, big welfare state should be introduced. Now, you ask, when did I realize there was flaws in the system? I realized this as a child because I was shocked by my experience of uh, seeing people, immigrants, who were otherwise, you know, well-educated, who'd had top jobs in their home countries, become, all of them become dependent on welfare support. And I could see that the welfare state was creating social poverty. Instead of helping people, too much welfare was actually harming them. And... The funny thing is that the the myth of Nordic socialism working, it doesn't exist in Nordic countries. In the Nordic countries, they don't believe socialism works. The Danish prime minister recently gave a speech at Harvard University, and he said, stop calling Denmark a socialist economy. We are a market economy. And uh, they are. If you look at the index of economic freedom, Denmark has the same economic freedom score as the United States. Now, what this means is, their score is dragged down by having uh, high taxes and generous welfare s- systems. But in every other um, measure of economic freedom, Denmark is m- much more of a capitalist country than the United States because they have much less government involvement in their economies. And if you read my book, Debunking Utopia, I explain this is the Nordic success story. For a long time, for much of their modern history, 
They've had very free market oriented economic policy. And perhaps the best example is the Great Depression. Because while United States really struggled with the Great Depression, you had this uh, New Deal, socialism, the Nordic countries had lost of fair economic freedom, they didn't have government involvement, and they actually were super successful in creating jobs and getting growth back on track after the Depression. So the story of Nordic countries is very much about um, the success of economic freedom. Let's talk about those high taxes. You have a chapter in there uh, in uh, Debunking Utopia on taxes alone and in part trying to figure out how it's possible that these governments could get away with the tax levels that they've had. And you note that some of the taxes are concealed from the public. So if you were to go to people in some of these countries and say, how can you tolerate paying X percent of your income in taxes every year, they would be baffled that you would even say that because their view is that they're paying about one third of their income in taxes, but it's much higher. How is that the case? Uh, oh, yeah. And this is a big, imp important question. I know maybe your listeners are thinking, why are these guys talking about Nordic countries? I mean, who cares? But this is very important. Why is it that America never has, the left in America has not been able to introduce very high taxes, while the left in Denmark has been able to? Why is it that while Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, Bernie Sanders would like to see the same high taxes as in the Nordics in America, they're not succeeding in uh, doing so. The most important reason is hidden taxation. The social democrats in Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland were not able to introduce high taxes until they started hiding the true tax burden. And last year I did a very big uh, survey in Sweden where we asked people, what is a total tax? You know, add up all the taxes on a normal person. How, is, how high is that tax? And people, many people think that a tax is below 30%, the total tax burden, whereas the true total tax burden in Sweden is 52%, uh, even on people with low and medium, medium incomes. So much of the tax burden is hidden. And around the world, um, the countries which have high taxes are those which have successfully hidden them. And the thing you should be very concerned about is that um, the American left is trying to slowly hide the tax burden and really Obamacare is one of those steps because Obamacare is a way of actually creating kind of tax funded public health care without uh, calling it a tax. I'm looking at uh, very early on in your book you give a couple of statistics relating to life expectancy and I to me this reveals the the slippery way the left has tried to use these countries as a bludgeon with which to beat market economies. They'll say things like, well, look at these countries have longer life expectancies than we have in, in the United States. So that goes to show that their social and economic system is superior. But you puncture that quite effectively just with a couple of simple observations. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, if you want to um, argue against your liberal friend and you happen to buy the book, you can just look up the statistics. Because in America, a very common argument is, look at Denmark. They have the highest tax in the world. Uh, they have socialized medicine. They have a lot of government uh, support for when you're sick, government benefits. And, oh, look, they're living one and a half years longer than Americans. So if you become social democrats, we live one and a half years longer. Well, in my book, I explain the following. In 1960, Denmark had lower taxes than the United States at the time. Uh, they had very, you know, small government. At that time, before the big welfare state, Danes lived 2.4 years longer than Americans. And this is not only Denmark. All the Nordic countries had higher gaps in lifespan compared to Americans before they transitioned to big welfare states. And today, if you look at the Nordic countries, Denmark, which has the highest tax, has the lowest Nordic lifespan. Iceland, which is the only Nordic country never to really go towards social democracy, has the highest lifespan. And maybe you say it's because Iceland has such a fantastic climate. I mean, their country is literally called Iceland. It's very cold. Uh, Iceland is a volcanic, you know, barren country. But... They have a Nordic culture. They have a Viking culture. They like going out. They like uh, doing sports, taking long hikes, eating fish. 
and their culture is what makes them live long, not socialized medicine. So I think this is very clear that a lot of the success of Nordic uh, societies is not about politics, it's about their culture. And really, everything that Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama admire the countries are things that existed before the welfare state and are due to a culture rather than a unique uh, policy. Yeah, let's talk about that. When you, you place a lot of emphasis on culture in this book, so tell us about the cultural aspect of the success of these countries. So essentially what happened in Nordic countries is these countries were um, populated by independent farmers who owned the land, and they were living in this very difficult climate. It's very difficult to be a farmer in the Middle Ages in the Nordic countries because the cold, uh, you know, you have to work really hard to survive, and the weather is quite unforgiving. And what happened is that these Protestant people developed unique uh, working ethics, unique responsibility ethics, unique ethics about helping your neighbors, and a, a lot of trust in strangers. They would cooperate together. And what happened when once free market systems were introduced in the Nordics, uh, for a long period they had um, free markets, very limited government, combined with these Nordic super norms. And the Nordic people thrived. They became super successful. And what I think the Bernie Sanders supporters or even the Hillary Clinton supporters would be shocked if they knew is that all the good aspects about Nordic countries like uh, uh, income equality, long lifespans, low child mortality, um, low poverty, all of this evolved before big government. And they evolved because the cultural traits of hard work, individual responsibility. So I think understanding Nordic um, success really makes you understand the limits of what government can do. Because the social success of the countries admired most by the left in the U.S., by the left globally, is not about politics. It's about culture. Well, I think one way of, of trying to verify this theory would be to do something that you, you do in the book, which is to look at people who live in Sweden and then people who move from Sweden to the United States and see, do they carry these different characteristics with them? And do they have success here in the United States? Um, and maybe we can learn something from that. In other words, comparing apples with apples. So talk about that. What have been the experiences, for example, of Swedish Americans? Yeah, so you should know that a large portion of the Nordic populations uh, migrated to the United States. And there are more Nordic Americans than there are uh, people in any individual Nordic country. So it's a big group, I think like 12 million. And I look at the Nordic American population, and you know, you should know that it was mainly the poor people uh, who migrated from Sweden to America. Not the wealthy ones, but those who didn't own anything, who didn't have any land. So you might expect them to be less successful than their cousins in the Nordics. But what I find is that the Nordic Americans have 50% higher level of prosperity uh, in terms of incomes than their cousins in Nordics, which is a huge difference. And maybe you say, okay, we know free market capitalism in the U.S. is uh, better at creating economic prosperity. But what I also find is if you look at social metrics, Nordic Americans are much, much more successful than their cousins in the Nordics. Their unemployment levels is almost half of that uh, than their cousins in the Nordics. Their high school uh, dropout rates is much, much, much lower. And shockingly, I really think Bernie Sanders would be shocked if he knew this, the poverty levels of Nordic Americans is much, much lower than the poverty levels of the their cousins in Nordic countries. And I show this to be true, you know, for Swedish Americans, Finnish Americans, Danish Americans, and Norwegian Americans. So it would seem that the American system, once you compare apples with apples, is not only much better at creating wealth, it is also better at creating social good. And this is completely in line with my other observation that Nordic countries' social and economic success was um, more pronounced before they had big welfare states. You have a chapter on where the American dream really 
comes to life and that and it builds on some of the points that you've been making just here i think it was in the huffington post where there was a snarky article saying something along the lines of do you want to pursue the american dream then move to finland and you have absolutely no patience with this whatsoever well you know one of the really big arguments that the intellectual left does is that the american dream of income mobility social mobility comes through in the nordics and it's not only Huffington Post. There are many leftist intellectuals who've said this. Bill Clinton, one of his main uh, points in the book uh, Back to Work was that the American dream comes true in the Nordic countries. So this is a, one of the big drivers for the American left. They say we should introduce democratic socialism because that will fulfill the American dream. And in my book, I show that no, absolutely no, the American dream uh, of income mobility and health mobility and uh, education mobility seems to be much more alive in the U.S. than the Nordics. And what I do is I look at immigrants and I show that immigrants in the U.S. are much, much more successful uh, at getting jobs and their health is better than the immigrants in Nordic countries, even though um, the Nordics have socialized medicine. And the education outcomes of the children of immigrants are much better in the United States. And I even show these differences once we, you know, uh, make a difference between low educated immigrants and highly educated immigrants. So maybe this comes as a surprise to Americans. But if you look at Nordic countries, if you look at Northern Europe, the European welfare states are currently having huge social problems trying to integrate immigrants. Uh, we've got ghettos, we've got fighting, we've got crime, we've got... Uh, stones being thrown at the police, we've got cars being set on fire, we've got young people joining ISIS, moving to Syria and Iraq to be radical fighters, terrorism. And the reason, wh what's the reason? Well, the reason is that, one of the reasons is that immigrants are not given that good of a chance to climb the social ladder in the European welfare states. The fact that European welfare states seemingly have social mobility is because they have like one big group is homogeneous societies. So Swedes, yeah, Swedes climb the social ladder because all of the Swedes come from this culture where they work hard and have this uh, a lot of you know social capital, individual responsibility. But once you have other people coming to Sweden, they're not successful, which again is my point. Their cultures are successful, but their systems are not very su successful. The basic story, and I focus on Sweden because that's the country I know the most about, the basic story of the Swedish welfare state is a story of Swedish prosperity prior to the welfare state when you had a more or less market economy where you had from 1870 to 1970 a century of, of, of tremendous growth, prosperity, entrepreneurship, uh, business expansion and then that really slows down certainly entrepreneurship slows down with the the very very high taxes and the uh, economic growth slows down but couldn't somebody in Sweden say it's true that it slowed down in the era of the welfare state but not catastrophically and I'm willing to accept somewhat lower growth in exchange for people having free health care people having their basic needs met so that nobody feels like one disastrous health event could ruin them completely. You know, you could certainly say that, um, but I'd like to make a few points. Firstly, when Sweden and then other Nordic countries, when they had small welfare states, they were very successful. When they had basically, you have a education for the poor supported by government money, tax money, that was a good system. But once they moved to a large welfare state, one important thing to realize is they didn't really get any social advantage. And currently, we have a big debate about the fact that many people are not given health treatment because it's a public health care system and uh, you wait in a long line to get health care. And it could easily be half a, year, uh, half a year, one year, two years before you're given adequate treatment. So we even have recently stories about cancer patients in Sweden not being given treatment. And then the doctor says, we can't treat you. It's too late. So you should realize that their systems are not that well functioning as you would imagine, firstly. Secondly, the Nordic people would be much, much, much more prosperous if they had lower taxes. Uh, I think my comparison with Swedish Americans shows that Swedes would be uh, approximately 50% more prosperous if they had uh, American 
economic system, which is a lot. That's a lot of money for an average family. And lastly, one thing I think uh, you should realize, and I explained this well in my book, Debunking Utopia, is that if you look at Sweden, we had four different economic policy periods. One of them was when we had very free markets, and that was super fantastic. The other one is the early social democrat period, when Sweden had a small welfare state, but stayed true to its um, free market policies. That was kind of successful in terms of uh, growth. Then Sweden had this period of experimenting with socialism, which was an absolute catastrophe. And lastly, since the beginning of the 90s, we've had a lot of market reforms. We've been cutting back on the welfare state. The generosity of the welfare state has been reduced. And a number of um, economic freedom reforms have been introduced in Sweden that even Americans would never kind of think about, like partial privatization of the pension system, we have a lot of for-profit schools uh, through a voucher system. We have a lot of for-profit uh, elderly care centers. So a lot of the Swedish welfare system has been uh, liberalized. So, And this is a story of all Nordic countries. In many cases, Nordic countries have more free market policies today than the United States. And the reason is They've been trying to compensate for a big welfare state by having economic freedom in every other area possible. I, I want to close by asking you to tell us about, if if I may, your experience as an immigrant family. Your family came to Sweden as immigrants, and as you say, they were apparently on the receiving end of some of the Swedish benefits. How, did that help you see anything up close that helped clarify your thoughts later? Did you see – was there anything good or was, and was there anything negative in your experiences with these sorts of programs? Yeah, so uh, of course the good thing was that uh, the Swedish welfare system supported uh, our family. Uh, both me and my brother, we have, um, I, I mean, we've got PhD degrees and all of our education was funded by tax money. And if you come from a poor family, you, of course, um, you know, you're happy to be able to go to the best universities, even though you can't pay for them. So that's certainly good. But I really, really, I, I experienced how a family uh, where uh, my parents could have worked, um, absolutely my father could have worked, and he did work, but, and my mother also worked. But, you know, it's a, syst a socialist system where it was easy to live off the government and difficult to get a job. And one of the most perverse things I experienced was that when my mother was working, we were actually getting the same amount of money as when she was not working. And when I grew up, one of the things I wrote about, one of the policy reforms I wrote about and then later was actually introduced by the government was, I said, come, come on, please have a system where welfare families will get more money if they start working than if they don't work. And that actually became policy. And uh, the, the government, I mean, the uh, bureaucrats, they acknowledged that they took it from my, my report. So I, but I mean, Sweden used to have that system and it was terrible because you would see how otherwise middle class families would become welfare dependent families and it changed their mentality and it changed the mentality that they were uh, transferring to the children and I think if you're interested in policies if you're interested in how society works one of the reasons maybe you'd like to read Debunking Utopia is I explain uh, with a lot of detailed research that yes too much welfare actually hurts the poor this is not just an argument it, we know this by looking at the Nordic countries, we know certainly that too much welfare actually hurts the poor. It traps them in dependency. And that was family experience. And that is one of the main reasons why there's so much social unrest in the European welfare states. It's one of the reasons why you have cars burning, you've got police attacked in Paris, in Stockholm, in Gothenburg, in many of the cities in the European welfare states, is that large groups of people, mostly of immigrant origin, are trapped in government dependency. And then you have, you know, the parents' generation is trapped in government dependency, their children's generation is trapped in government dependency, and it just continues. So, absolutely, having some can really help people who are from uh, marginalized families, but having too much generous welfare actually is bad, even for the poor. Well, the book is Debunking Utopia, Exposing the Myth of Nordic Socialism, linking to it on today's show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 717. Nima, thanks so much for your time and best of luck with your uh, media tour here in the U.S. Thank you very much. 
All right, that's going to do it. Tomorrow I've got a fun episode. I'm not going to tell you anything other than that, but you're going to find it fun. Friday, it's whether we should abolish the FBI. I mean, don't you? This is why you listen to this show for topics like that. But I also want to mention, of course, you know that uh, I'm hosting a cruise with Bob Murphy aboard uh, the Liberty of the Seas. I'd love to say we planned it that way, that it happened to be Liberty of the Seas, but we're too inept to plan something like that, of Royal Caribbean this this October 2016. is going to be a ton of fun. we got all kinds of fun things planned for you guys when you get there. So it's just going to be a blast. got to check it out at ContraCruise.com. And if you don't listen to the Contra Krugman podcast, you won't know our joke. But the idea is in the podcast, we try to engage in the most awkward segues into promotions of the cruise. So somehow the topic of nuclear weapons will come up and Bob will say something like, you know where there won't be nuclear weapons? The Contra Cruise and whatever. So it's 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 my, one of my favorite things. So the T-shirt we're designing for everybody who joins us on the cruise, on the back of it, we're going to say, you know where you won't have to explain this T-shirt? I mean, it's, it's, gonna, it's just going to be great. So if you have any desire to spend a week with Bob Murphy and me, well, after getting your head examined, go sign up for the Contra Cruise at ContraCruise.com. Thanks for listening. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.